Hello everyone and thank you for joining. I would like to share with you some of my thoughts about the following topic. Depending on the methodological tradition, adult insecure avoidant or dismissing attachment may or may not be linked to internalizing symptoms, a conundrum. In the following presentation, I'll start by speaking about the theory behind the link between attachment avoidance and internalizing symptoms in adulthood and move on to briefly discuss the ways in which attachment avoidance are assessed in adulthood. I will then highlight the empirical evidence to the divergent links between attachment avoidance as assessed in two main research traditions of attachment and internalizing symptoms. I'll then move on to try to think about why these divergent links exist and end with some thoughts about future research. So let us first touch base on the theoretical link between attachment avoidance and internalizing symptoms. Baldy noted that loss gives rise to sorrow. Early in life, we have a natural propensity to form emotional ties with our primary caregivers. However, as sometimes is the case, if we lose these emotional ties, either because we lose the parent uh, physically or because emotionally the parent is not available to us or outright rejecting us when in need, we develop an expectation that support may not be there uh, when we need it. And we stop soliciting support from our caregivers and later on through other attachment figures. That leads to a prolonged sense of distress, which is known to cause and be a strong correlate of both depressive and anxiety symptoms. Accordingly, in the purpose of avoiding distress or alleviating it, some individuals use deactivation of the attachment system in order to downplay the felt threat and or limit the processing of threats altogether. Assessing attachment avoidance in adulthood has been done in two main ways. In the social personality tradition, insecure avoidant attachment styles are assessed through self-report questionnaires such as relationship styles questionnaire and experiences in close relationships. Individuals who score higher on the dimension of insecure avoidance tend to exhibit discomfort with closeness and discomfort depending on others. Example items that load on this dimension are, I find it difficult to trust others completely or I prefer not to show a partner how I feel deep down. However, in the developmental tradition, attachment avoidance has been assessed through narratives, often exhibited through the adult attachment interview, or the AAI. The AAI is a semi-structured interview that asks about participants' past experiences with their primary caregivers, commonly their parents. The interview focuses less on the experiences themselves and more about how the participants talk about the experience. This is also known as, known as the coherence of discourse. Low coherence of discourse leads to classifications of insecure attachment. One pattern of insecure attachment or type is the insecure dismissing, which is the parallel type to the insecure avoidance in the social personality tradition. Individuals who are classified as insecure dismissing tend to score high on the state of mind scales of either idealization and or insistence on lack of memory. For example, such participants may report that their relationship with their parents um, were very loving or very warm, but will find it very difficult to remember or come up with an example of such idealized relationships. Of note, in a small scale meta-analysis, the two traditions assessment of insecure avoidance or dismissing has shown to only trivially correlate with a correlation coefficient equal to 0.15. So we can already see that the two traditions assessment of attachment avoidance do not align very well with one another. But the conundrum really bolsters when we assess the empirical evidence of the links between insecure avoidance as assessed 
in the two traditions and internalizing symptoms. When assessing avoidance by a self-report, research has shown that those who score higher on the dimension of avoidance tend to endorse more internalizing symptoms compared to those who are lower on the avoidance dimension. Given that secure individuals are characterized by low scores on the avoidant dimension, one may think of these findings as avoidant individuals having significantly more internalizing symptoms compared to their secure counterparts. Let's look at some examples. Here are the studies that assessed 106 romantic relationship partners. In both men and women, those who scored higher on the avoidance scale also tended to endorse higher depressive symptomatology. In another research from China that assessed more than 650 college students, those who scored higher on the avoidance dimension also tended to endorse more anxiety and depressive symptoms. And finally, 350 adolescents who were higher on the avoidance dimension tended to endorse more depressive symptomatology both concurrently and five months after the initial assessment. However, two large-scale meta-analyses that our group published in the past two years assessing between 4,000 and 5,000 individuals showed that AAI dismissing individuals did not endorse significantly more depressive or anxiety symptoms compared to their secure counterparts. Interestingly, more evidence to support the divergent links between the two attachment tradition assessments and internalizing symptoms can be found in the only study to my knowledge that assessed both AAI insecure dismissing and self-report insecure avoidance within the same participants to predict internalizing symptoms. As you can see on the left column, those who scored higher on the dimensional AAI dismissiveness tended to endorse significantly lower amount of internalizing symptomatology. However, as you can see on the right column, those who scored higher on the avoidance dimension in the RSQ self-report tended to also endorse significantly more internalizing symptoms. So taken together, the conundrum reveals itself. That is, depending on the methodological tradition, adult insecure avoidant or dismissing attachment may or may not be linked to internalizing symptoms. So how may we understand these divergent findings? One way of trying to better understand the divergent association between the attachment assessments and internalizing symptoms may be through the relational domain. AI is primarily focusing on early experiences with one's primary caregiver, whereas self-report measures primarily focusing on peers and romantic partners' experiences this may be important because if in adulthood we rely on our peers and for the most part romantic partners for both proximity seeking and effective soothing versus our primary caregivers, it may well be the case that self-reports are better predictors of internalizing symptoms in adulthood compared to the AI. Another important point of difference between the two assessments of attachment is that of appraising interpersonal difficulties. Those who are classified as insecure dismissing in the AAI tend not to appraise interpersonal difficulties. In fact, they tend to report past experiences as quite positive. In the self-report assessments, those who score higher on the avoidance dimension, by definition, tend to explicitly appraise interpersonal difficulties. This point of difference may be crucial because assuming that for the most part we assess internalizing symptoms via self-report, self-reported avoidance and self-reported internalizing symptoms may very well correlate by the very fact that individuals that tend to appraise difficulties may score higher on both of these assessments. Lastly, the nature of both assessments is quite different. Unlike self-report measures, the AI is a dyadic assessment, 
where participants' attachment patterns are indicated also by their ability to respond to the interview questions in an organized and collaborative manner. Individuals who are classified as insecure dismissing in the AI exhibit real-time redirection of their attention away from the interviewer's attachment-related questions. As such, the AI may provide a more ecologically valid assessment of the attachment avoidance strategy compared to the self-report. Why even bother solving or at least better understanding the conundrum? This may be the case because of two main reasons. First, from a theoretical point of view, we want to know better whether or not avoidance fulfill its purpose. If avoidance is in the service of decreasing internalizing symptoms, we might deem it adaptive. However, if it leads to experiencing of more internalizing symptoms, we may deem it more adaptive. This may have direct implications to psychological interventions. In other words, depending on whether or not it's adaptive, we would better understand if we want to quote unquote treat avoidance such that individuals may have or may exercise less of this deactivating strategy, or maybe we should support the function of avoidance because it actually does a pretty good job in buffering internalizing symptoms. So what can we do in future research in order to better understand and perhaps even solve the conundrum? First, we would like to assess antecedents of both measures within the same participants. The theory is that adult attachment is shaped by early experiences with caregivers. And thus, we would want to be able to say that both, or at least one of these measures, follows the theory. Currently, we know that AAI has early caregiving antecedents. We don't know much about the early experiences that shape self-report attachment assessment later in life. Moreover, we would like to pick both measures within the same participants against subjective measures. However, we need a priori hypotheses to launch into such endeavor, so we need a theory. An example of a set of a priori hypotheses, and very much in line with the current virtual conference, has been put forward by Long and colleagues in a paper that was published earlier this year. As you can see on the right side, and based on synthesizing multiple attachment-related studies that assess attachment avoidance and other types of attachment through both traditions and neuroscientific outcomes, they put together a set of hypotheses about the differential links of the different attachment patterns and brain functionality and activity. As you can see, avoidant attachment is differentially linked to neuroscientific outcomes compared to both the secure attachment and other types of insecure attachment, the anxious attachment. Accordingly, we would be able now, within the same participants, to pit the two attachment assessments against this brain activation and functionality objective assessments and make sense of which one of these two corresponds better with the a priori hypotheses. And then we could integrate it into a larger mediational or other models that link AI dismissing or self-report avoidance to internalizing symptoms through brain activation and functionality. In conclusion, we've seen that adult avoidance and dismissing only trivially correlate. Where self-report avoidance is positively associated with internalizing symptoms, AI dismissing is not associated with internalizing symptoms, at least when compared to secure individuals. Future research should focus on a priori theoretical hypotheses to assess both antecedents of adult avoidance or dismissing and their objective correlates such as neuroscientific brain function markers. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Please do not hesitate to contact me, and I hope we meet soon.